Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Colourgraph. I'm Artemis Irvin, and in today's episode, we're uncovering a crucial year in the history of Britain's slavery past. How we reckon with our national past is one of the most important conversations we can have. When I was at school, I wasn't taught anything about the British Empire whatsoever, which is an extraordinary thought when you consider how much of the world today was shaped by what we did then. That's why I was fascinated to read our guest today's latest book. Alex Renton is a campaigning journalist working on poverty, development, the environment, food culture and food policy. He has won awards for investigative journalism, war reporting and food writing. His latest book, Blood Legacy, Reckoning with a Family Story of Slavery, is an account of his own family's involvement in slavery during the 18th and 19th centuries. Hi, Alex. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today on Travels Through Time. So before we get started, I just wanted to ask you some general questions about the book. It's a really unusual, unusual and extraordinary one. And I kind of wanted to find out when and why did you first decide that you wanted to write it? Well, I... I I mean, I think, you know, like like lots of the books you get caught up in, you you know, I kind of had to write it. I I, I mean, and and simply because I was in uh, my... Um, grandfather's, my mother's family's sort of ancestral home in, in Ayrshire, the Falling Down Mansion in Ayrshire, where my grandfather, who Sir James Ferguson, who was a historian, had, had catalogued 500 years of family papers um, going, uh, and, and, and I was fossicking around in those uh, in the basement um, of my cousin's house, um, looking uh, mainly because I'd, I'd been writing a book about public schools and I'd realised that my own family had been to, pub, to, to boarding schools for 11 generations and so I was interested in finding their schoolboy letters. Um, and in the catalogue I kept seeing Jamaica and Tobago come up a ridiculous number of times. I asked my mum who said, oh yes, hmm, yeah, my father did say that we had been briefly involved in slavery like everybody else, meaning every other posh family in Scotland in the 18th century, uh, and, but, but we'd made no money and, and, we, and she shouldn't worry about it. And so I was intrigued. So, so, I, so that started a, a job of transcribing you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of letters from the 18th and 19th century. Um, and, and then going to Jamaica and Tobago to see the end result today and talk to people who were at the other end of slavery, the descendants of them. And I think I sort of had to do it because I'm aware, you know, although my family's not wealthy because of slavery now, like many others, you know, I'm, I'm clearly a privileged white man whose privilege comes from that ancestral wealth uh, and power. Uh, and, and you couldn't really not do it. It's a, it's a great story and relevant to Britain today with all its arguments and problems. Then Black Lives Matter came along and, and the, the story became, became more relevant than ever. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about the source material you described going through your family archives and going through all of these letters. It really struck me when you mentioned in the book, um, particularly in the first half, when you're using the letters between your, is it your five times great uncle and his brothers. And they're discussing the plantation in Tobago and you mention in the book that there is a lot wanting in these letters that they they don't there doesn't seem to be much discussion of the moral implications of their activity or even any talk about the rebellions that were happening on the island at the time and I was really interested to find out how did you go about navigating that source material and interpreting it because that because you have to sort of read between the lines or or try and figure out where where and why there are these gaps in in the letters. It was it was complex on, on several levels. I mean, I mean the, the the letters are an amazing gift. I, I mean, in the sense that they're a fantastically vivid first hand account of a twenty six year old man going out and buying uh, essentially jungle and seventy African people to clear it, and then working alongside them to start a plantation. And and that really doesn't exist. 
in, uh, there isn't an account like it in, in 18th century British slavery history, and particularly not in Tobago, where there are very few records. So you're dealing with this stuff, which, you know, on, on one level is very revealing. It might, the younger brother, James Ferguson, writes to his older brother Adam and, brothers Adam and Charles in, in, in very vivid terms. There are jokes, there are complaints, there are sadnesses and lonelinesses, and some moral detail. I find it very hard to separate myself as a journalist and historian from myself, the descendant of these men. Instantly, I found it, I empathised. I could, didn't condone in any way what they did, but, but I understood, I felt for the dangers and difficulties and, and, and the horrors that this young man sent out to, with a huge, you know, millions of pounds of money to spend and, and a huge huge amounts to do in terms of pleasing his family uh, and then his death after four years from dysentery I felt I, you know, I felt I understood him and that made it much more complex because he seemed to me a man of my time I mean it's someone I could I could talk to however much I deplored his you know his murderous actions and that then made it because this is a one-sided account which doesn't include any of the horror. The horror is just there in the, in the audited accounts when you suddenly realise that the death toll is 50% over seven years. And also the complexity of seeing that they do, you know, these are Christian, liberal, educated men. His elder brother was rector of Glasgow University and an MP and, and, and a liberally-minded reformer dealing with human beings as farm animals. So underneath the jokes and the talk about how good, what a good thing it is to treat them with humanity, there are lines where my great-great-great-great-uncle asks his older brother to approve the design of the brand he's come up with for burning into the, the, the skin of the chests of the young Africans he's bought. So it was hard. I, I mean, in terms of, as a historian trying to put it, you know, there is very little, almost n no material at all from... 18th century Tobago. In a way, you have to comb other accounts of plantations in Jamaica and more written about places in, to, to get an idea of what was really going on. And also ask yourself, you know, important questions about why, about the self-censoring. I mean, my, my ancestor I know was part of the island militia. There were only 400 white people on the island at the time. So he would have taken part in the putting down of the uprisings. Um, of slaves that happened almost every year at that during the 1770s in Tobago. So he would have known that human beings were being pinned to the ground and made to watch their own arms being hacked off before being burnt alive at the stake. But he doesn't write any of it. It, it in a way, it threw up more questions about their morality and in than 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 it answered. It was interesting. I hope I'm not sounding as though I'm excusing in any way their actions, because I can't. But what I do think from the beginning of this project, it was important that to, that to realise these are men of our era. They are white men like the white male class that I belong to today. So I had to understand that I, in their position, might have done the same things. And it seemed more important to recognise that than to see them as monsters. I mean, they are mon they do monstrous things, but they are real people. They're not frothing, frothing overseers out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. And I think to truly understand the horror of what they did, the moral horror as well, you have to understand they are humans like us, educated, liberal. Yeah, yeah, it's a very, it's a disturbing but um, important thought, isn't it? Why do you think it's taken so long for a book like this one to be written. As far as I understand, it's quite unique in that not many other people, if anyone has written their own personal family history in relation to slavery in this country. And I guess what I'm asking is why do you think so many British people are so uncomfortable or so unwilling to confront this particular aspect of our history? It, 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 it is shocking, isn't it? I, I mean, the first thing you do is compare it with America, where, where lots of people in my position heirs of the of the wealth of slavery um have have done it I mean, there are books where people have tracked down tracked down every enslaved person that their ancestors owned in 1865 when slavery was abolished there it, we british you know and i can see this in my own education i did it, have managed to to 
keep the story in, and particularly the gruesome details of it at arm's length ever since the end of it. And I think it, it's clear now that within 10 years of the final abolition in 1838, um, we were already the Victor- we were already promulgating this myth of, of, of British exceptionalism around slavery, whereas the, the, we were the good guys of the story, rather than those who'd shipped more Africans, 3.25 million, than, than, all, than, than any other nation except Portugal, and done it for 250 years. Um, Eric Williams, um, the great first Prime Minister of independent Trinidad and the great historian, um, wrote that in the 1960s that the, the, the British historians wrote almost as though the British had indulged in slavery purely for the satisfaction of abolishing it. Um, and, and I look back at my expensive education and the two history O-levels I did and go, I, I, I was fed propaganda. Mm. My, my ignorance was extraordinary. A lot of, you know, I, I, I couldn't have told you five years ago the date that British slavery ended in, in the colonies. I could have told you when Wilberforce abolished the slave trade because that was our triumph. But um, what has been shocking in the reaction of this book, and indeed the, the, since, since the Colston statue fell in Bristol, is, is the rage of people who have the same educa- education as me, white middle-aged men, many of them, who will not have the notion that the British Empire was anything but all good questioned. And when I say, ra- I mean rage, it's not, not reasonable debate, it's furious comments in pieces in the Times about my book, about Satnam Sangira's book, about others. Racist comments, which sometimes don't get moderated at all. Uh, and, and that sense that, and it's happened with some members of my own family, you know, the, the the undermining of this core belief in what we are as British people is is un, unhandleable. Is, is you know, some people just it, it just goes so straight, so so to the core of what make makes them the people they are that the questioning of it isn't isn't something they can tolerate. It's a shocker, I think, uh, because we don't move on. We don't deal with racism today until we deal with our racist past. Mm. And we seem to all agree we want to deal with racism today. Mm. But that seems to be by denying what we, the powerful and privileged, did and have inherited. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the most important questions of our age at the moment. So, Alex, if you could travel back in time, what year would you choose to visit? I would love to visit. Um, I, I'm going to. It's 1838 slash 1839 because I want to start my year in in uh, July 1838 and end it in August 1839. Um, and I've chosen that that year because it's it's an immensely significant date uh, in British history, which. British history kind of doesn't really note or notice. People in the Caribbean are very aware of 1st of August, 1838. It is Emancipation Day. Uh, funny, I, was, I Googled it the other day. Wikipedia doesn't even mention it in its great events of 1838. But it was the day when 700,000 or so African origin people in the Caribbean finally became legally free under the British Empire. And my, the great moment, the moment I, I picture um, is a scene in a, in a churchyard, in a little Baptist church in Falmouth, Jamaica, um, where the Reverend William Nibb uh, held a ceremony, um, I think at midnight on 31st of July, 1838, surrounded by his parishioners who were, um, I think, almost entirely black and and uh, mo- and all the adults at that point were still indentured labor they were a- apprentices under the terms of the abolition of slavery which had had been announced and celebrated four years earlier um took a coffin and put in it a pair of manacles uh, some chains and buried it in the ground standing round in the graveyard outside Nib's church. Uh, Nib, I should say, was an Englishman who, who'd fought for 10 years to first to end, finally end slavery and then to um, end this system of apprenticeship that, went, that continued after slavery. Um, 
and had been to jail for it. His black parishioners had funded him to go to England to go and do an immensely successful speaking tour um, around churches and to Parliament and to the British church uh, in the early 1830s to push forward the slavery abolition bill. Um, so this very much his and his parishioners, um, his black parishioners, poor black parishioners triumph. So they stood around a, a, a grave they'd dug in, in the little graveyards in Falmouth and uh, brought forward a coffin with a whip, chains and an iron punishment collar and buried them all. And the inscription that's still there that they put on this grave was Colonial Slavery Died, 31st of July, 1838, aged 276. It's such a powerful symbolic scene. I think it's a great one to visit um, as our first. I guess um, I wanted to ask you, why is it that we don't remember this particular date and we tend to remember 1807, uh, when the ab- abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed. Why, why is it that we neglect this particular moment, do you think? It's, it's shameful, isn't it, Artemis? It, it, it is a huge moment because it's the beginning of you know, Britain's, Britain's story of itself as the great liberal empire that brought civilization and decency to, to most, of, most of the world. Um, uh, and we don't remember it, I think, because the whole, of, the whole series of events was shameful. I mean, to to anyone anyone looking back at it, whether they were Vic, Victorian liberals or or people today, uh, we we the, uh, uh, those people. If you ask most people, white people of my age, when slavery was abolished in Britain, they really it, sorry in the British Empire, they really won't be able to tell you the date. And I'm not sure I could have done ten years ago. But but the fact is that the Act was passed in 1833. Most people say slavery ended in 1834, which is when. Um, the, the the act came into into force, but um, the deal that the to get the act through Parliament that was done was was by pay, this immense payoff to the owners of the enslaved people twenty million pounds in in money there then a straight from the British taxpayer into the pockets of some of the wealthiest people in the Caribbean and in Britain, uh, £17 billion in today's money, but also a deal again unrecognised where the enslaved adults, everyone over six, had to continue working for no money, uh, only for food and lodging, on the plantations where they'd been enslaved, and with very few rights for another six years. Um, So, as is pointed out, the value of that labour meant that the enslaved people ended up compensating the the slavers, the the plantation owners, like my own ancestors, um, uh, for giving them their freedom. it was a shabby, shabby deal, and, and such was the outcry over it that it came to an end early, uh, four years early, which is why uh, slavery finally ends, and this is the date we should celebrate, on 1st of August, 1838. And um, we're often told that it's the moral arguments made by abolitionists like William Wilberforce that were the main kind of driving uh, impetus behind the abolition of slavery in this country, that it was like everybody just turned around and saw sense all of a sudden, thanks to him. Is that the case? Is that is it? Was it the moral impetus that caused the end of slavery? Yeah, I, I think it, in the end, it it, it it is the result of, of a great moral crusade and an ordinary person's crusade. I mean, I mean, this it, it's fueled by the accounts of uh, black people escaping from slavery that published in Britain, by churches, by women. Uh, it was one of the first women, woman-led mass popular movements, the boycotting of sugar and so on, and, uh, 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 and, and mass petitioning of Parliament. But, but in the end, it, it, by 1834, it, it's just not possible I think for any government to to have continued with that massive massive rage coming from the ordinary electorate, um, and, and of course people who couldn't vote as well, like the women, uh, but so it is a mor- but the deal to end it is not moral at all. It's entirely about buying off the you know Tory government did it, uh, buying off the vested interests with enough money to shut them up, and. And, and obviously enough, the compensation that went to my own family got three million pounds in today's money in compensation for giving up their two hundred slaves in Jamaica, uh, giving them freedom uh, in quotes. But uh, but the enslaved people got absolutely nothing. In fact, they had to work work for another four years, as we've said. Uh, 
so morally driven, but like so many political fixes, entirely, um, entirely cynically achieved. So that leads us on to, you mentioned all of the compensation that was um, given to uh, families like, um, like your ancestors as compensation for giving up their plantations. That leads us on to the second scene that you'd like to visit about a year later. What Would you like to tell us what scene that is? When I, when I was in Jamaica and, and in Trinidad and Tobago, uh, talking to people who... who who could well have been the descendants of those who were enslaved by my my ancestors. A lot of people said to me, so what, what was done with all the money? Did anything good come of it? Because that history is much better known there than it is here. And there, they're well aware that all the slave owners got compensation, £17 billion pounds worth in today's money. And there are lots of stories about what... I mean, you know, it's the beginning of the Industrial Age. There's a story where in Scotland where there were more slave owners compensated than anywhere else per capita that the big families who didn't have debts to pay off with it um, put the money straight into railway shares but uh, rather more obvious is an amazing event very expensive event it's kind of like a Glastonbury for the very posh which was held a year almost to the day after the final end of of apprenticeship and thus the end of slavery in, in the Caribbean colonies um, in Asia. Um, a few miles from where my ancestors lived, um, by the Earl of Eglinton. Uh, and this was the Eglinton Tournament. And the, it was really a, just an extraordinary tipping point, really, between which went straight back to the Middle Ages. In, at the beginning, Queen Victoria had been crowned the year before, uh, into the beginning of the... Victorian era and the, and the modern age as we know it now. And basically, Eglinton and a lot of his mates, all titled, and uh, my own family, decided to have a massive party. But the party they wanted to do was recreate, as realistically as they could, a proper medieval jousting chivalric tournament in the style of the Field of Cloth of Gold and all those great meetings between English and French kings in, in the late Middle Ages. Um, and this was inspired by the fact that Eglinton's own ancestor had had um, taken part in one of these and managed to, man, he, he was employed as captain of the Scots Guards to King Henri of France. And he managed to kill Henri of France during this tournament by a mistaken spear blow which went into the French king's eye, um, which is something which a Lord Eglinton was very proud of. So he, in his 30s, just designed this tournament, set it up, had practice, invited all his mates, had practice rounds in London, um, and spent something extraordinary. He died, owning, he died owing £40,000, and it was said that all, the de- all his debts arose from staging the tournament in his, the fields below his brand-new castle in Ayrshire. Um, so he built lists he built marquees he built grandstands he built a banqueting hall and as this thing took off and the newspapers got more and more excited about it it more and more people said they wanted to to come so he didn't ended up having a hundred thousand visitors brought by newfangled trains and steamships you could sit in the royal in, in in a sort of royal stand um, if you paid money, but only if you could prove that you were a conservative voter, because this was very politically driven. Uh, Eglinton and his friends believed that Britain in the indus- grubby industrial age was losing touch with its 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 chivalric past, with this golden, you know, very much inspired by the novels of Sir Walter Scott, this golden golden history in which people, which knights performed brave deeds of gallantry and the serfs clapped and the peasants applaud, uh, peasants loved every moment of it and dragons were slain. So they, they staged this party, presumably with the idea of, um, of, uh, of making Britain into a, a great, sh- great chivalric pers- place again. Le- Queen Victoria couldn't come. But they got various. Um, they got some French nobility, and they got a, a, a Napoleon's a, a, Nap- a relative of Napoleon Bonaparte, a future emperor of France, and they spent and spent and spent. So Lord Glenlyon, uh, 
um, spent uh, 1,346 pounds, which, which according to the sort of income indicators of, if you try to translate sums then to sums today, is about 1.2 million. Not just on velvet, man I'm reading from his shopping list, um, velvet mantles, steel demi-suits of armour, melee swords, lances, horses, and so on, but also on equipping uh, 78 of 78 of the crofters and, and clansmen who lived around his um, his castle in Athol. He, he was the son of the Duke of Athol. Um, to, so he could arrive with a retinue as well to impress everybody. So, of course, like so many... Scottish events, British summer events, this all great fanfare, all the newspapers attendant, as I say, 100,000 spectators, um, start, was to take place in the first weekend of August in 1839. And then the weather arrived. And it was one of the worst washouts of you know, any, the muddiest Glastonbury you've ever seen. The tournament stands were blown down, the uh, everything, the chivalric cloth of gold and so on was covered in mud um, the banqueting hall disappeared over in the winds spectators complained they had to wade for a mile through a flood plain in order to get to the place um, the talk of people uh, it, some of the spectators apparently drowned in a, in a, in a crush through a mud pile but the, the, their worst complaint was that it was all really boring because it turned out that ho heavy horses in armour and knights trying to get at each other through mud is really slow and quite dull and there's no replay screens either and the only and worst of all perhaps for the spectators the only injury was um to edward jerningham the honorable edward jerningham who sprained his wrist slightly while jousting at some at another night and as you can imagine the newspapers declared the age of chivalry dead and was savagely mocking. So Queen Victoria wrote in her private diary that the tournament had clearly been the greatest absurdity, and the spectator, who wrote a long report about it, headlined it, Eglinton's Emasculated Mopstick Middle-Age Recovery Society. Um, the, everyone really enjoyed the failure, and, and, but it probably, in a, quite a real way, made, 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 it, it was you know, the age of chivalry and and the beliefs of these young men who thought their titles and their wealth still made them the natural natural rulers of Britain took a really severe knock. But, and it's interesting, I, when I found a, a, an account of this written in the 1960s, I was intrigued because I, I, I thought I had a direct connection to it because cause when we were kids playing in, in the, the house my, my mother's family owned in Ayrshire, um, we used to try on some chain mail that we found in an attic, incredibly heavy. And my grandfather said this had been worn by my, by his great, great uncle, who had been a page to one of the knights at the Eglinton tournament. Um, so I felt very connected to it. But also, looking back at it today, I realised, of course, that his, he could afford a chain mail hallbook, which because we've still got the shopping lists from the only armourer left in London who made all this stuff, we, we know it cost a couple of hundred quid, because, perhaps because my family and their partners, their cousins, the Hunter Blair family, had received the equivalent of £3 million in compensation just two years before for the liberation of their 198 enslaved people in Jamaica. And then, it's interesting, because the only account of this, which is a rather... A, a, so, popularly written history book um, from 1960 by a man called Ian Anstruther makes no mention of, of the origins of the wealth, the millions spent on this tournament in today's money. But if you go through the lists of everyone who appeared, it is a list of slave owners. The Castles family, the Glen Lyon family, the Airlie family, the Dallas, the Fairleys, the Crawfords, the Montgomerys, the Kennedys, the Oswalds, the Cunninghams, the Balfours, the Campbells, the Belcarries, Lindsays, not just Scottish as well, but English as well. In Englishmen, the Gages, the Howard, the Walden, Staffords and Seymours. I mean, so what struck me reading this list of names is not least that I was at school with some, with some of their direct descendants, because I'm a member of that ruling class, but also that these people remain, many of them, those names remain famous, they're among the ruling elite of Britain today, still wealthy, still running things. Yeah, it's, it's such a, like you say, such an absurd scene. 
and really again kind of symbolically powerful about it really struck me that the fact that it was middle a it was medieval themed it's kind of interesting how we think about our relationship with our nation's history and yearning for something a golden age some kind of past this like eternal uh looking back and thinking oh, things were so much better then and obviously like you say it was just as it was just as awful for the people at the bottom then <laughs> as it was in um, 1839 and as it is in 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 many ways today as well i, I think that's absolutely right and it, it's important you know to, to teach teach uh, people better or teach ourselves better about the reality of these things because we think of this as you know this trying to protect and and mythologize uh, british the british past as, as a right-wing thing but but actually we did people on the left do it as well i mean there's, there's all around the environmentalist movement there's a there's a sort of glorification of, of an idea of pre-industrial agriculture britain where where we all lived sustainably off the good of the land whereas in fact the history of britain is, is of is of famines and droughts and 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 disasters like as that of any other nation the only difference is that we never rose in modern times in rebellion in successful rebellion mm. against it and to go back to the the tournament for a moment um how how conscious do you think the party goers were of how this event was likely being funded? Was that something that people were able to confront at the time? I was really struck in your book how you talk about the not just the tournament, but there's a kind of material legacy across the whole country that exists today of homes and gardens and parks and buildings which are funded by this by slavery or for the compensation from the end of slavery. How conscious were people at the time that this was how all of this, all of this building, all of this building work and the tournament included in that were being funded, or was it kind of deliberately ignored, or were people ignorant of it? I think people were, 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 would have been very ignorant of it. I think you know, it, it's much easier, obviously, now to find out these things. You can type your family name uh, or any ancestor's name into the into the University College London legacies of British slavery database and I would suggest you do because it's very interesting uh, and find out exactly what was going on and that wasn't available I, I mean the but the the event I mean, it was billed at, at you know, was was uh, was for Tories I mean it, it was quite specifically you could get a ticket to watch it if you were could prove you were a Conservative Party voter or supporter so so I don't think I think most people went along as you might today to gawp at the w rich and famous and silly um uh, have, having a good time it's 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 a royal knockout um the, there was very little protest popular protest some in the churches uh but outside that none against the massive the 20 million compensation paid to the slave owners in 1836 and and I think also a lot of the money would be hidden I mean Eglinton himself who who ran who who spent the entire family fortune on building this castle and then the, the medieval tournament um uh his I mean his slavery connection is through two marriages to to another Ayrshire family who had who who were planters and made fortunes as bankers banking bank running the saving industry but but he, the Eglintons directly never owned slaves. It was his mother and his aunt who brought the, the slavery money into the family and funded this stuff. But that wouldn't have been clear to anybody. And I don't. And radical voices weren't pointing out that connection till much later. If anything, the the venom of the abolitionist, uh, abolitionists is directed more at slave at sugar traders and people like that in the eighteen thirties. I mean, there are leaflets that say the bodies of roasted Africans have been found inside, inside, inside uh, sugar barrels. Every cup of tea you drink with sugar in it is tainted with the blood of, of an enslaved person. Mm. But the, the bigger sort of, what we see is a sort of auto, you know, natural way of looking at the, the, the capitalist structure, and particularly the role of the elite and the aristocracy in... in in directing Parliament to make slave owning as profitable for them as they could, is, is that's a later, a later 
um, analysis. I mean, the, the other thing interesting about the Eglinton tournament is, is the press reporting of it. I mean, I quoted the spectator, is entirely mocking and negative, even the Times. I mean, it's quite interesting. So, so the, the excessively wealthy aristocracy were having the piss taken out of them, just as they, they might by a newspaper columnist today. You know, everyone could see, except for perhaps the, the titled young men on their horses themselves, just how silly this was. Mm. Yeah, if the sun had shone that weekend and everyone had a good time, had had a good time, maybe we'd go down as, as something rather, you know, like, like a, you know, a good royal tournament. But actually, it was a fantastic waste of, of money, which turns out to be rather ill-gotten money. I was interested as, as well as something you discuss in the book that contemporaries made various moral distinctions between um, type, ki- kinds of involvement in the slave trade, that there was being a trader as in being involved in the actual uh, kidnapping of African people from um, the west coast of Africa was more more immoral than being involved in owning a plantation in the Caribbean. Um, and it, 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 was, it struck me that even contemporaries at the time were sort of tying themselves in knots trying to justify what was clearly an inhumane, uh, inhumane practice. Yes, I, I think it, it's very, the, the sort of public reaction is very comparable with, with some of these arguments today. I mean, certainly if, if, in, I mean, when I was a student, we, we were campaigning against apartheid in South Africa and the involvement of British companies there, you, know, you heard, kind of heard the same sort of arguments where, you know, we're in there because that's one way of helping the economy improve so things can be, can be made better for the black people. You hear those sort of arguments in the 1820s and 1830s. Modern PR and lobbying work done to, to, to excuse some people. But certainly, in, in, we have to remember, while we all celebrate Wilberforce and for bringing about the abolition of the transatlantic trade, the, not the trade between the colonies, an, another often forgotten fact, it, in, he, 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 and, he was almost certainly against slavery itself, but he and his... A parliamentary lobbying team decided to campaign for slavery to continue, just saying let's stop the nastiest bit of it, which is the which is the which is the trade itself. But partly because they knew they couldn't win the whole argument, because the British economy by the early eighteen early nineteenth century is so dependent on the tax revenues from the slavery related industries, twelve percent of GDP. So, so it was that was their strategy. But I think if you'd said to Wilberforce in 1792, it's going to take another 30, 40 years to actually abolish slavery with the savagery that goes with it, he would have been, he might have <laughs> strategized differently. But so, so my ancestors completely covered up the fact that we did do some slave trading. We financed a, a ship from Tobago to West Africa. But the plantation owning is a bit better and by... By the 1820s, 1830s, it's all in the hands of lawyers. You know, there's virtually very few records at this point in the family archive because it, it's not that profitable by that point. And, and also something you can, you know, you can leave with your business people. You don't, you know, it doesn't have to interfere with your life. Whereas the f- previous generation were very involved in the management of it. You know, as you'll know from, from other contemporary records, I mean, Jane Austen is really interesting on, on, on the changing of, of British attitudes. So there's a lovely scene in Mansfield Park where um, someone mentions um, that uh, the heroine's rich uncle, uh, mentions his um, slave trade plantation and his plantation in Antigua. And the conversation in the drawing room at, Man- at Mansfield Park stops in dead silence. And it clearly couldn't be said in, is it 1815, I think. Um, it was just embarrassing. But this is still 20 years before the end of it. At Travels Through Time, we're incredibly proud to be partnering with Jordan Lloyd and Colourgraph. Jordan is one of the world's leading visual historians. Through his excellent craftsmanship, he brings black and white photographs of the past to life in startling colour and clarity. Jordan's extraordinary work, as well as that of his contemporaries, can be found on the website colorgraph.co.
At colorgraph.co, you'll be able to explore the process and history behind the colorization work, but most excitingly of all, you can also buy some of these beautiful photographs as museum grade fine art prints. They make an unusual and striking present for that friend or family member of yours who loves the past, and they're an excellent addition to any room. Whether it's a colorized photograph of the US Capitol building from 1846, or a candid shot of the Beatles from 1964, you're pretty sure to find something that enchants you. I know I certainly have many times. It's hard to explain really over audio just how cool these prints are, so I encourage you to have a look for yourself at colorgraph.co. What's more, Travels Through Time listeners get 10% off when they enter the code TTT at the checkout. Alex, what is the third and final scene that you would like to visit? We're in 1839 now. Um, where would you Where would you like to go? Uh, I want to go to Rochdale in Lancashire, where two really interesting early Victorians, um, both of them to become radical, meaning sort of leftish, reformist members of parliament, brought a, 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 a friendship which had been associated around politics and basically in campaigning for better um, education for the poor. They were both rich men of humble origins, um, but who'd done well in the cotton trade in Lancashire. Richard Cobden and John Bright. And they, in 1839, uh, formed the Anti-Corn Law League, which um, was drew a lot on the methods of the anti-slavery protesters a decade earlier, but was really an entirely philanthropically minded uh, enterprise, which was to campaign to for 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 free trade in corn, um, and to end the system of support and subsidies and protectionism, as it was known, um, because that would lower prices um, of corn, and thus uh, enabling the poor to be fed better and enabling farmers to compete in a, on a level playing field with imported corn and so on, um, and uh, would all all round be a, a better thing for the economy and for, for the British population. Um, and that, of course, you know, started a debate, a, a political theme um, that continues today. No protectionism, free trade. And this was an amazingly successful campaign. I, like the sla- sla- slavery abolition thing, it was done in public meetings, tracts and pamphlets, nine million anti-corn law pamphlets published in 1843. Uh, and John Bright and um, and Richard Cobden rode this wave, became very significant parliamentarians, and, and basically persuaded the Tories to abolish the Corn Laws, which they did in 1846. And free trade and the right of free trade, the God-given moral right, the, the moral superiority of, of untrammeled trade has remained a cornerstone belief of the right, as we know, ever since. Um, when subsidising agricultural products or, or protecting protecting production of them was first questioned. Obviously, you had the, the thinkers thinking behind it could be expanded to all sorts, and sugar was among them. So, when the, the, in 1846, when the, the Corn Laws were repealed and free trade in corn more or less begins, uh, at the, in the same bill, sugar was included. The British government had essentially subsidised sugar production in the British colonies in um, the Caribbean um, from the beginning, whether by direct tariff help or whatever, or or indeed by devoting the lives of of hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors to defending the islands and fighting off the other European nations who would have them. But at a stroke, the tariff support, the subsidies in essence of British sugar imports from their own colonies in the Caribbean were ended. And this um, through was a disaster for my family, <laughs> who found that the value of their sugar plantation in Jamaica um, collapsed. Um, it was a disaster for um, all the white planters who had been promised support by the British government only 10 years earlier when the end of slavery was was pushed upon them. Um, and it was a disaster for the 700,000, or by this point, more like a million um, descendants of enslaved black Africans now living their first years of freedom on those 
colonial loans. I mean, job losses were 40% in, in Jamaica in the next two years. And, you, and Jamaica and Barbados and Antigua and Demerara and so on and the other colonies were left really to stew in abject poverty uh, right till the end of the 19th century when some trade in, export trade in fruit begins. And this is a consequence of this liberalising of trade law um, under the, the Corn Laws um, title um, that really was ignored and unseen in Britain. Um, because the West India lobby that had been so powerful, the white planters who, who were so important to the British Exchequer, had you know, lost their, their muscle, they'd lost their wealth at a stroke. And black people suffered really badly. Um, there were famines, and, and the white planters still held out against um, any grants of land and, and often political and voting rights right, th right through until the 1860s and the 1870s, which is something I go into my book. And you can see from my, my family, we're down to earning £250 a year in rents for the plantation, subletting it to a, another sugar, sugar planter, whereas they'd been earning 10 times as much 50 years earlier. But they don't appear to have cared about the plight of the descendants of the people um, who work for them in any way at all. And this, this um, discussion, and I mean all of the discussion that we've been having today, it really, for me brings to mind the question of reparations because it's it really I found it fascinating when I was researching for this interview and obviously reading your book that when you um when you read about the anti-corn law league or you do the most kind of cursory of um googling this uh effect that it had on the colonies um in the Caribbean is not mentioned at all even though it was clearly disastrous it's very much focused on the UK and um a lot of our history I think is very insular and is very focused on what happened domestically and refuses to acknowledge the countless 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 networks of cause and effect that was um, as a result of our empire and this kind of refusal to acknowledge the consequences of our actions at home and abroad it does it does make you wonder is is it even possible to repair some of the damage that we have inflicted on so many parts of the world, uh, and specifically in this part of the world in the West Indies, is it possible to repair that damage? It's a re really good question. I, I don't think it, it, it cannot be, it is not possible. I mean, and just taking the Caribbean alone and leaving India aside and, and all the other places where we exploited and stole and called it so bringing civilization. 3.25 million Africans shipped by the British to the Caribbean and to the United and to America pre seventeen seventy six. Um, all their descendants, people who you know, it, it was a genocide. The average life of a slave was four years, and they were cheaper to replace with a new adult than than to try and breed than try and breed you know like farm animals. It's not just those lives, those wasted lives, um, but the descendants who we then left to stew in poverty really through to independence. I mean, it, 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 in, in, in India, is, in life expectancy just for independence was 32 years versus 60, 65 in Britain. Um, li illiteracy was 50% in Jamaica when we gave the country its independence. The whole, the, whole, the, the, the subsequent myth that we built for ourselves of you know, the, these client states, who, you know, looking happily to the motherland who would then send their, their young men to fight our wars and, and, and you know, young men and women to clean our toilets um, with joy in their hearts. It, it, is, it is what it looks like. It's a pile of, pile of sad, self-deluding self propaganda. The crimes post-emancipation are are huge, I think. And I'm lucky that, you know, that I, I'm able to go into that in the, in the book a bit. Again, I'm sitting there going, I, I didn't know any of this. Joseph Chamberlain, who was um, uh, Foreign Secretary in, in, in 1899, I think, commissioned a public inquiry on the state of the West Indies and said, this is the darkest slum of our empire. He, he meant the, the poorest, most appalling conditions. But we basically let the people who helped us build the wealth of the 19th century and, and you know, the, the infrastructure of the empire, we gave them their freedom, as we put it, and then we left them to stew. 
So how do you begin to put right for that? So you ask people, and this is clearly the only way to do it, ask the descendants of the people we exploited um, as enslavers and colonisers, and they'll go, well, could you start by acknowledging it? That would be a beginning. Beyond that, I, you know, I, I look at my own family, you know, have looked deep, we've looked deeply at ourselves. You know, we're not wealthy because of slavery anymore, but we're clearly privileged because of the wealth our recent ancestors had, my grandfather's grandfather owned slaves. And you have to say, is it right that I and the comfortable nation I live in are better off than, than the nations of those whom we enslaved? Is, is it right that you know, mo most, most people of African Caribbean origin here were, have enslaved ancestors, that they died at four times the rate um, in COVID as white middle class people? And there are a load of other statistics you, you could bring up. And how can I actually call, you know, call myself moral and equitable if, if I tolerate the kind of racism that that statistic implies and all the other racisms we know about? So an awful lot can be done with apology and acknowledgement. That's how you get to reconcili reconciliation, as we've seen in other countries. Germany did it quite effectively after the Second World War, and most people would agree. We've not just ignored the need to address it, but told black people they have no right to ask for these things, that they should be grateful and shut up and get over it, which is pretty much what Boris Johnson said when he was last asked about it. Um, so there's an awful lot we can do, but pay back, put it right, not possible. I, 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 there's a... I've got a friend in Scotland, uh, Sir Jeff Campbell, who's Scotland's first black professor. He, he rather laughs at that. Who was born in Jamaica. His mother came over with Windrush. And um, he says, you can't change the history, but you can change the consequences. And that's, of course, that's true. And, and mm. so inspiring. Well, before we uh, head back into the present, as it were, you're allowed to bring a memento with you from 1838 or 1839. What memento would you like to bring back to remember this very dark and important year in British history? Um, do you know, I, 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 when I was thinking about this, I, I was going to get a, a pair of gold knight spurs made by Mr Cobb of Mayfair, the last armourer in London, priced at three pounds, three shillings for Lord Glen, Ben Lyon. Uh, but actually, I don't, I, I've changed my mind while we've been talking. My, I've got an Edinburgh ancestor, Agnes Renton, who's a great-grandmother a great times three, who was a, an abolitionist, and she campaigned for abolition of slavery in the Caribbean, and then right till her death in the 1850s for, for abolition in, in the United States and Cuba and Brazil. And, and she would distribute leaflets, and I'd like one of her leaflets, because they pointed out that... Even though the British had ab abolished slavery in 1838, they still went on eating sugar from cheap, cheaply produced by slave pe enslaved people in Cuba and Brazil. So she didn't. She was a white person who, who listened, and got it. And there were many others like her in the 19th century. And, and she's an example of, of you often hear people saying, well, we can't judge the people of the of the past on our standards of the present. But actually, there were people at the time who were completely aware of how totally wrong and immoral the the actions were then. So it's not really true, is it? Absolutely. It's such a silly argument, isn't it? I mean, 400,000 people petitioned Parliament in 1792 to end the slave trade. These were modern people. There was a modern, you know, there was the beginning of the modern era. Nothing that much has changed in many ways, which is quite shocking too. Well, Alex, thank you so much for joining us on Travels Through Time. It was a really, really fascinating discussion and um, it's an excellent book. So thank you. That was me, Artemis Irvin, speaking to Alex Renton about the years 1838 to 1839 and his book, Blood Legacy, Reckoning with a Family Story of Slavery which is published by Canongate and is available to buy now. I really hope you enjoyed this interview and found it as interesting as I did. We'll see you next week.